Man, that's a humbling song. Uh, well, your love ran red and my sins washed white. Amen. I owe all to you. Man, that's powerful. Amen. I don't know if you've heard that song before or if you sang that song and you didn't realize what you were singing. And I encourage you, even if you don't understand what you're singing, if you want to just listen, that's a great thing to do is just listen. Try to make sense of the songs. But, but let me just explain it to you. On the cross where Jesus died, Jesus gave his life because he loved you. He didn't do it because he had to. He didn't do it because some cosmic force made him do it. His love ran bread for you on the cross. And the result was your sins were washed white. Amen. Amen. And because of that, not because I want to get in close to God, but simply because God loves me and Jesus died for my sins. I owe all to Him. And we're going to talk about that here in a little bit. I just want to make sure that we get on the same page. And so I'm going to take a survey. And so this requires some per per participation. I want to say precipitation. we got enough of that right now. But participation. You'll have to watch my grammar up here. Sometimes I say things like that or, you know, amphibious instead of ambidextrous. I do things like that, so you've got to watch me. Catch how many times I say the wrong word. But I want to take a survey. And I want us to get involved. And so let's just start with the easy one, okay? How many of you guys like the snow this morning? Okay, that's more than I thought, okay? How many of you guys are ready for warmer weather? Oh, okay. So we like the snow, we want warmer weather, we want it both ways. We want it to snow in springtime, right? Well, that's good to know. How about this? Let's see if we can get more on the same page because we weren't quite 100% together. How many of you guys like rock music? Okay, okay. How many of you guys like country music? I will pray for you guys. It's okay. How about classical music? Anybody? Okay, good. Wow, surprisingly, I think we agree. Classical music is the way to go. Uh, we're about 50-50 on that still, kind of split up. I saw people raise their hand on all three. That's good. Diversity. But I want us to get on the same page, and so... Got a few more questions here, then I'll move on, I promise. How many of you, and this is just for my information, how many of you were raised in Clinton? Wow. Surprisingly few of you. How many of you have moved to Clinton within the last five years? Majority. Okay. Well, that's interesting. Let me ask you this one, and this is more getting on topic. How many of you have ever prayed or talked to or asked God for something? Every one of you. You know, it's funny. Uh, I talk to people all day long. Some of them are followers of Jesus Christ. Others would classify themselves as more being agnostic, where they believe there's a God. And then I talk to those that are atheists. And then at the end of the conversation, a lot of times I'll offer to pray for them. Do you mind if I just have a word of prayer for you? Not, not for your soul, not for... Just can I pray for you? Sometimes it's a grandmother who's sick. Sometimes it's a situation they're in. And you, you know the... The common ground between the agnostic, the atheist, and the Christian is that all let me pray for them. And to take it a step further, at one point, every one of them have talked to God. So I just want us to get on this common ground, whether you're a believer in Jesus Christ or you don't even believe in God. All of us, at one point in time, have talked to God. We all have that common similarity. Now, this isn't a survey question. This is that question that I ask to kind of set up the sermon. When you talk to God, when you argued with God, when you shouted at God, when you prayed at God, what did you expect? What did you expect? What did you expect from God? And that's where we're going with the sermon, is what do you expect? What do you expect to happen? What do you expect from God? You know, um, I, I do Twitter every once in a while. Uh, I saw that Joseph retweeted my tweet. Thank you, Joseph. Where you at? Appreciate it. That's a true friend whenever, no matter what you say, they retweet it. That's a true friend right there. Eric, you're slowing down, man. But I tweeted something this morning, and it, it, it came out of my prayer time early this morning, and, and it dawned on me, I've been here for four and a half, almost five years. And in that time, I've learned a lot about being a pastor. But more than that, in the last four and a half, five years, I've learned a lot about being a follower of Jesus Christ. 
I mean, more than learning about being a pastor, I've learned how to follow Christ better. And one of those things that I'm constantly learning about is prayer. And if I can just get honest with you, and some of you, this statement may offend you, but I, I've got to say it anyways. Sometimes my prayers suck. I don't know how else to say it. Sometimes my prayer life, the way that I talk to God, it really just isn't up there. And I think if you guys were to agree with me, you have a lot to learn about prayer too. And so that's what I've been focused on these last few months is praying about prayer and learning about prayer, studying about prayer. And I'll probably have a lot to share with you guys in the coming months. But, but this week, I want to just talk about one thing. is What do you expect when you pray? Whenever I first became a Christian, I started to learn that prayer was something more than just reciting something. But I, as I learned, sometimes I learned some false information. Sometimes I took it wrong. Sometimes it was just that people told me wrong. Hey, can you turn this down just a little bit? Channel 15. But that's better. There we go. It's not ringing up here now. But I, I kind of had this idea, and, and just see if you guys follow along with this. Whenever I would pray, I would try to pray the right way. You know what I'm saying? I used to pray in a way that's like, if I get all the words just right, if I say them in order, and if I say thee and thou and amen, or in Jesus' name, amen, that if I said it just right, God would answer my prayer. That's kind of what I started to believe when I first became a Christian. And I read books like The Prayer of Jabez. The Prayer of Jabez is this little section of the Old Testament that says, Dear Lord, open up my horizons and bless me indeed. And I thought, okay, that's what I've been doing wrong. That's why I can't get a girlfriend is I'm not praying the Prayer of Jabez. And so I started praying the Prayer of Jabez. And now remind you, this is after I'm a Christian. This is after I have surrendered my life to Christ. And then I, I, I learned about the sinner's prayer. And this really worried me. Because I read the sinner's prayer, and I got it out of order whenever I accepted Christ. When I gave my life to Jesus, it, it said that I said, admit, believe, confess, because I had learned ABC. Salvation is easy as ABC. Admit to God that you're a sinner, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, and confess with your mouth, Jesus, Lord. And that's the way I was taught. I, and so I did that. I admitted that I was a sinner. I believed. I confessed. But then I read the sinner's prayer, and it's in a little bit different order. It's more like believe, confess, admit. And so I prayed the sinner's prayer thinking, maybe I didn't get the words just right. Anybody ever feel that way? Yes. The Lord's Prayer? You know, if I don't say it just right, maybe God's not hearing my prayer. And maybe that's just me, but as I've grown a little bit, I've realized something. Prayer is not a spell. Let me say that again. Prayer is not a magic spell that you read from a book hoping to get the right incantation to make all your problems go away. That's not prayer. Amen. That's not what prayer is. It is so much better than that. Prayer's not that. But then as I grew up, I started to have traditional prayers. And I started to say things in my prayers that everybody else was saying in their prayer. And I felt like because they're saying it in their prayer, I need to say it too. You know what I'm talking about. Dear Heavenly Father, please bless this food. Right? In fact, your parents probably at one point in time said, we need to sit down and say the blessing, right? Okay? Now just imagine, as a kid, I'm eating Cheetos, praying, God, please bless this food. What's he going to do? Turn it into carrots for me? I mean, what am I really expecting of him whenever I ask that? And, and, and if, if any of these hit home with you and you pray these prayers, I will never correct your prayers. You pray what God puts on your heart. God does want to bless your food. He wants to bless everything about your life. All I'm saying is I prayed it because everybody else prayed it. Another prayer. I used to pray, be with us, God. I still do that sometimes. I catch myself saying, God, be with us during this service. Can I tell you a little secret? God is with you always. He told us in his word, he promised, I will never leave you or forsake you. So please pray that prayer. Say, God, be with us. And you know what he says? I'm right here. I didn't go anywhere. Maybe what we need to be praying is, God, bring me back to you. Because I keep trying to get away from you, but you keep bringing me back. God, I want to be with you. He says, I'm with you always. Then my favorite, and I'm about to get sacrilegious. I apologize. But... Dearly Father, please give us a hedge of protection. A hedge 
of protection. I can't tell you how many times I prayed that before youth group would go to Falls Creek. But shouldn't I ask for something better than a hedge? I mean, what, what, can't Satan just like bust through a hedge? I mean, we should pray for brick walls, right? <laughs> hedge of protection. It just didn't make any sense, but I heard everybody else pray it, so I thought I should pray it. And I'm not saying that it's a bad prayer. What I'm saying is, maybe we should think about what we're praying, because prayer isn't just a magic spell, but it's not tradition either. Can you say that with me? Prayer is not tradition. Prayer is not tradition. Now, tradition is good, but prayer is better than tradition, amen? Prayer is better than a magic spell. Prayer is better than tradition. <laughs> prayer is good, guys. And so as I've grown as a Christian, I've kind of learned these things. Just a real quick funny story. I, you know, with Mia, the daughter being sick, we have to find humor in things that other people wouldn't find humor in. And so that little idea of prayer, prayer at a hedge, my dad and I were talking about that one time, and there's a comedian that does a little bit about praying for the hedge and all this funny stuff. And so we had in the back of our mind how funny that was, and we had just watched this video about it. And we go in to pray for my daughter with his deacons. And one of the deacons, in this quiet, intense moment, prays, Dear God, we pray that you would put a hedge of protection around Mia. I was the hardest thing I ever had to do was not to laugh during my daughter's prayer before her surgery. That's sad, but it's true. It's sad, but true. Because sometimes we don't think about what we're praying about. And so what I want to tell you is that prayer is better than a magic spell. It's better than tradition. But as I've grown, I was asked a question a few years ago. And I'm not going to try to answer this question today because I've spent the last three years studying this question. I just want to propose it to you. A, a pastor friend of mine asked me this question. I think Eric was there the night he asked it to me. Can you change the mind of God? Some of you guys are going to be quick to say yes. Some of you be quick to say no. But think about it. Can you change the mind of God? That's a deep question. I, I invite you guys to do some study on that. But the follow-up question, because my immediate response was no. And his, his, his response to mine was, then why do we pray? Ooh. Man, that's some deep theology for Sunday morning when there's snow outside, huh? We're, deep, we're sinking deep in that snow right now. Here's what I want to tell you about it. Can we change the mind of God? That's, that's questionable. I don't know. I mean, God is unchanging. He's not changing. But I do know this in the Bible. There's a group of people that are sinners. And they're the worst kind of sinners. They're foreigner sinners. They're, 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 they're not part of our group, and so they're bad people, right? That's For some reason, people get that idea in the Bible. If they're not part of our group, they're bad people. But we're all sinners, aren't we? And so this group is called the Ninevites. And, and so and whenever I read the story of Jonah, I used to kind of relate to Jonah because he's the man of God going to see the Ninevites. But as I've grown in maturity, I relate more to the Ninevites. Because I realize that I'm a sinner in need of a Savior, not a Savior looking for people to save. I'm a, I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. How about you guys? Amen. And so Jonah goes over to this group of people. And God says, go to them because tell them I'm going to destroy them unless they turn to me. And Jonah doesn't want to go. And you guys know the story of the big fish swallows it. You might get a sermon on that pretty soon. But ultimately what happens is Jonah goes and he talks to these people. And instead of destroying them, God saves them. And, and I thought about that. We're all destined for hell until God saves us. Does God change his mind? I don't know. But I know that he made room for people like us. For all of us to turn to him. To be saved by him. I know that in the scriptures we're told time and time again to cast our cares upon God. We're told in James, if you have trouble, what should you do? Pray about it. In James, another place it says, you have not because you... Here's what I've learned in the last few years. God has his set ways that are going to happen no matter what. And then he has this thing where he allows us to come to him and to ask him. It's called prayer. It's our chance to talk to the creator of the heavens and the earth and ask him to intercede for other people and for this world. Let me say this 
this way. Prayer is our chance to talk to God about what we believe needs to happen. That's what Jonah went and told the Ninevites, and the Ninevites turned to him. James said, if you have trouble, pray. And here's what I've seen, is there are things that God wants to do for us. There are amazing miracles that God has for us. And all we have to do is ask him. My kids ask me for stuff. Do your kids ask you for stuff? Yeah. Clark, don't shake your head. Yes, you don't have kids. <laughs> for a good one, I can get the youth minister to agree. Your kids ask you for stuff. But, you know, there are things that I wish my kids would ask me for. I wish my kids would ask me for more prayer. I wish my kids would ask me to spend more time with them. I wish my kids would ask me for all these things. And there are certain times where I have candy set aside just for when they ask for it. God has something better than that. He's got some miracles for you. He's got some blessings for you. And this is not like financial and cars and things like that. This is spiritual blessings. And could it be that we don't have because we're not really asking him? <coughs> Prayer. <coughs> Prayer. It's our chance to communicate with the one who is in charge of it all and have a say in it. It's powerful. And so I want to read the scriptures, but before I do, I'm just going to make my point so I can get it out there. You know, I asked you how many of you guys pray, how many of you talk to God. Every one of you raised your hands. And then I ask the question, what do you expect from God? Well, I want to read a story about some people, and maybe we can learn a little bit about when we pray, how we should feel afterwards. And so if you've got your Bibles with you, Acts chapter 12. If you don't have a Bible with you, there's one in front of you, um, one in those little baskets in front of you. Grab that. If you don't have one at home, take it home with you, read it. But we're in Acts chapter 12. And here's what's kind of happened. The Old Testament, we've already passed the whole couple thousand years of the Old Testament. And this whole time in the Old Testament, we've seen that we're sinners in need of a Savior. And the Old Testament points to a Savior to come. That baby born in the manger that we celebrate on December 25th, that's the Old Testament born to life, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ then in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John grows up, lives a sinless life, goes in at age 33, starts to be a minister, so to speak. He's a teacher telling people that He is the Son of God. He then dies on the cross. So that we could be with God forever. But he didn't stay dead. He rose from the dead. And now we're at the point in Acts chapter 12. Where after Jesus has ascended back into heaven. They start making this thing called the church. It's been around that long. Church is not a new thing. It's been around since the very first when Jesus ascended. They gathered together. I know that Eric preached on that last week. When they watched him go. And just kind of stood there. And the world was turned upside down. These men and women, their lives have been turned upside down. They're meeting together. In Acts chapter 4, we see that the church gets together and prays. Have you guys ever got together as a church and prayed? Now, I'm, not, I'm not just saying that you bowed your head when I prayed. I'm saying, have you ever prayed as a church? Man, I'm not a very good pastor because I haven't had you do that. We need to pray together as a church. Because listen to what happened when these people got together and prayed. People got saved. People's lives were changed. In fact, it even says that the ground they were on was shaken. I don't know about you, but man, I'd love to feel that again. I'd love it if we could all get together and pray so that we could see the town of Clinton shaken up a little bit. What about you guys, amen? How many of you guys want that? Have we prayed for it? Just curious. But this is where we're at now, is the church has gotten together to pray, and the church is growing. People are getting saved. People are coming to know Jesus Christ. And then something happens. Persecution. People are not liking the Christians. And so we pick up in Acts chapter 12. It says, It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church. Now, King Herod is not the same King Herod as when Jesus was born. This is actually his grandson. And so, a bad man. So I could just say that. It was about this time that a bad man was king. And he arrested some who belonged to the church. Now, we kind of get a misconception about what church is. Most of us would say that church is at 11 o'clock, right? That ch our church is at 17th and Custer. Our church is a Baptist church. But that's not what this is talking about. It's not talking about a building. It's not talking about a service. 
It's talking about every person who is a follower of Jesus Christ is the church. If you were a follower of Jesus Christ, I don't care if you're Methodist, Baptist, non-denominational. I don't care if you got saved in prison or if you got saved in the Sunday school. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, congratulations, you're a member of the church. They don't make it complicated. So... So what happens then? The church, is being, some people are being arrested. Intending to persecute them, he had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. Meaning, for simply being a Christian, this man was killed, executed. We don't really have to worry about that in the United States. We think of being persecuted as somebody making fun of us, calling us a Bible toad, right? Bible thumper, one of those Jesus freaks. But no, this man was killed. Verse 3 says, When he saw, that being Herod, saw that this pleased the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter. Now, Peter was one of the disciples. And this happened during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. After arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Now listen, Peter has been arrested because he's preaching the word of God. He's been arrested and put in jail. And at this jail, they put four squads of four soldiers. Sixteen people, if my math is right, sixteen people to arrest one man. Why is that? There we go. Okay. Just checking with you. So why was it that they put sixteen guards in front of Peter's place? Well, it's simple. The last time they tried to arrest Peter, Jesus broke him out of jail. Pretty cool, huh? How many of you guys wish that would have happened while you were in jail? <laughs> well, I'm glad that that didn't because you're here now. You guys are doing great. But here's the deal. Listen. They understood something was special about this guy. This normal person who didn't really have anything spectacular about him. He wasn't a murderer. He wasn't a genius. And yet they felt it necessary to surround him with 16 guards. Why? Because when you've been with Jesus, people realize there's something special about you. Do you understand that? Do you guys get that? That when you've walked and talked and been with Jesus, people see there's something special about you. 16 guards. And it says, Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. And this public trial would have been a mockery. The same way that Jesus was put on trial. In other words, all the people would shout, Crucify him! Right? And what would happen to Peter? Peter. What was the goal of Herod? It was to kill Peter. The expectation of Herod was to kill Peter. Let me say that again, because I want you to understand this. The expectation of King Herod was to kill Peter. Let's keep going. Verse 4, or verse 5. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. I love this verse. Let me say, read it again, because I want you to make sure that you guys get this. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. Let me, let me put it maybe another way. So you keep getting into trouble, but the church is earnestly <coughs> praying for you. So you don't have a job right now, but the church is earnestly praying for you. Your friends are all still living the lifestyle that you've gotten out of. But the church is earnestly praying for them. See it? Do you see what the church got together and did? It doesn't say that they worked on songs. It doesn't say that they got a five-part strategy of how to get Peter out of jail. It says that they got together and they earnestly prayed. Now that word earnestly, we don't use that word very often. Uh, some people, the translation will be like, uh, without ceasing or urgently pray. But listen, this word earnestly is this Greek word. And it actually comes from the origin of stretching a muscle. Now, it's been a long time since I've stretched any muscles. But from what I remember, when you stretch a muscle, when you start to work out, things get a little bit tighter. And man, you're just pushing as hard as you can. 
And, and, and the word here actually means to stretch a muscle as far as it can go without breaking. The church was praying as hard as they could right up to the point of breaking. Do you know where else this word is used? When Jesus was sitting in the garden of Gethsemane, facing the cross, it says that he began to pray more earnestly to the point that he started to sweat drops of blood. You see, Jesus took it one step further. He went past the point of breaking, and his body was broken for you and me. But the church here was praying to the point of breaking. Like I said, I've had some conviction this week about my prayer life. I hope you guys are feeling that too a little bit. It goes on to say in verse 6, The night before Herod was to bring in the trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains. And sentries stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared, and light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said, and the chains fell off Peter's wrist. And Peter amazes me. If I'm in jail, and it's my first week in jail, and I'm facing a trial that I know is not going to go well, and they're going to cut off my head, you're not going to have to poke me in the side to wake me up, because you better believe I'm going to be awake. So why was he at peace? Maybe it's because he knew there was a church praying for him. Huh, maybe. It goes on to say, Then the angel said to him, Put on your clothes and sandals. Wow. So he's not only relaxed, he's in the nude relaxing. <laughs> Quick, put on your clothes and sandals. And Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. He thought he was dreaming. He thought this was just a big elaborate dream or a vision that God was giving him. He didn't realize, hey, I'm outside the jail. Then Peter came to himself and said, Now I know without a doubt the Lord sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were anticipating. Now I circle that word anticipating because it sounds a lot like the title of the sermon. Expecting. Expect. Listen, Herod expected Peter to be killed. The world expected Peter to be killed. In fact, it says that they were anticipating his death. They were waiting for it. They were expecting it. Peter, he's just going with the flow, right? The people expected it. The king expected it. Verse 12, when this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary and the mother of John, also called Mark where many people had gathered and were praying. Remember the church we were talking about? That were earnestly praying? They were to the point of breaking for Peter? You guys ever been to the point? We were praying so hard that she thought at any moment I could just roll over and die. Ever been to that point where you were so broken that you were on the edge? The church was at that point for Peter. And it says that Peter comes to this house... <coughs> And can't you just see the great reunion that's about to happen? Here the church has been praying earnestly for Peter, and Peter's now there. In verse 12, when this had dawned on him, he went to this house. Verse 13, Peter knocked at the outer entrance, and a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer the door. And when she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed that she ran back without opening it and exclaimed, Peter is at the door! Your mother is healed. You've got the job. God loves you. God can change the town of Clinton. It was an answer to their prayers. Right? You guys see that, don't you? This church earnestly gathered. And so what's going to happen? They're all going to have a potluck, right? They're all going to get together and celebrate. Because that's how we celebrate when we're in church. We have food. Amen? I'm hungry, so I'm going to move on. But that's not what happened. So she, she exclaimed, Peter is at the door. She exclaimed that our prayers have been answered. But 15 says, you're out of your mind, they told her. What just happened? What just happened? This church that was so earnestly praying that Peter would be saved, that Peter would be comforted, that God would help Peter, they were so eager to pray, so earnest to pray, that when God answered the prayer, 
They didn't believe it. What do you expect from God when you pray? Be honest. What do you expect? You expect Him to ignore you. Why? Because we're faithless. We don't believe a God could actually hear us and answer our prayers. And when He does, we blame it on coincidence. I'm going to use Nathan as an example here. I know. Nathan got a new dirt bike. That's fair. And it's a pool start dirt bike. And yesterday, and this is a story from his mom, so I'm not just making this up. This is a real story. He goes to start his dirt bike. And you guys know how frustrating it is, don't you? I mean, we're doing it with a lawnmower, which isn't near as much fun as a dirt bike. But he's trying to start a dirt bike, and it's not starting. And so what does he do? Well, if it's us, we know what we're going to do, and it's not going to be very pleasant, right? But Nathan stops. Dear God, please let it start. Do you hear the faith? The mower starts. Not the mower. The, the dirt bike starts. It starts. And does he go on and ride his bike and everything? He stops and says, Thank you, Jesus. What do you expect when you pray? What do you expect when you pray? Let me just say this. Because some of you, you probably feel like I'm beating up on you. You feel like I'm beating up on myself. But listen, and this is what I want you to see here. We need to expect God to answer our prayers when we pray. Amen? We need to expect that God is listening, He loves us, and He's going to answer it. But here's what I want you to see. God answered the prayer of the church because God's faithfulness is not hindered by our faithlessness. Amen? He still answered the prayer. But my point is this. How much better would it have been if they were waiting at the door for Him? I mean, they just go and slam the door in His face and say, it can't be. It can't be. There's no way. You're out of your minds. When she kept insisting that it was so, they said, it must be His angel. They still didn't believe that God could answer such a hefty prayer. There's no way. Well, if, if somebody's there, it's an angel. They believed that Peter's angel would be there before God could save Peter. Verse 16, but Peter kept on knocking. And when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. They were shocked. They were amazed when God answered their prayers. Guys, I believe with my whole heart that God wants to do a mighty work in Clinton, Oklahoma. I believe that God wants to use Custer Avenue Baptist Church, the people here, not, the, not just the building or the, the programs, the people, you, to make an impact in Clinton. And I don't just believe it, I expect it. Let me say that again. I don't just believe it, I expect it. The fact that you're here this morning, I'm not surprised. The fact that you were saved from a life of drugs, I'm not surprised. The fact that you used to be a drug dealer, but God rescued you, I'm not surprised. And when Jesus Christ makes an impact so big that even the churches stand at all at what He has done in the town of Clinton, we will not be surprised. Heavenly Father, we ask that your mighty, powerful spirit be on this place now, God. Forgive me for my faithlessness. Forgive me for my disobedience. Break our hearts today, Father. God, we don't pray unexpected. God, we expect you to move here. We expect you to move in a powerful way. Just as we continue to pray. God, we pray that you would change our hearts. God, we pray that you would drive us to something more. God, that we would pray with expectation.